Hello everybody and welcome to episode number two of Let's Learn a Change of Seasons. Today we will be conquering the second part of the suite, going through every single note, every single time change, every single chord progression in a full detailed musical analysis of Innocence by Dream Theater. In addition to all of that, we will attempt to regain the innocence faded from the previous album and absolve the Dream Theater boys of any guilt associated with the untimely departure of Kevin Moore. Without further ado, let's get into the video. Innocence is a song-based track with a fully fleshed out verse, pre-chorus, and chorus, and it actually has lyrics this time around. The song brings back many familiar melodies and progressions from the first part, The Crimson Sunrise. This will continue as we move through the rest of the track, really solidifying a feeling of continuity. In true Dream Theater fashion, both verses are completely unique, but have a common fundamental thread linking them together. We also have plenty of heavy guitars and glassy clean guitars to help us get in and out of different dynamic ranges, so a lot of dynamism going on. Speaking of dynamism, the introductory riff does just that. It starts with a heavy F-sharp power chord, progressing through a series of very unique and interesting sounding chords with a downbeat emphasis, like this. Like I said before, we start on an F-sharp at the second fret of the low E string and then take the crazy train approach for the second chord. That's a D over an F sharp when you hold the second fret of the E and the fifth fret of the A. Now we don't hold that for very long. Remember, we're only playing quarter notes. We have to switch now to an E, just like this, a regular old E power chord, and then do this slidey tritone riff coming up to the seventh fret. And you have to play it exactly like that. You don't play it like a chord itself, so it doesn't get played like this which originally I thought that's how it was supposed to be played, but you actually have to slide into the tritone. And then let the top note ring out of the E string. The second time around we have to make an itty bitty change to that F sharp chord. We have to actually hammer into the fourth fret from the second fret like this, on that downbeat. So really it's just like the first time, but we have a hammer on now instead. To replace the E in the second tritone, we actually start with a tritone on the second half. So we're going to the fourth fret of the E string, like this. So that's a G sharp going to the fifth fret of the A to a tritone, okay? And then to a G to a D, just like that. So tritone, perfect fifth, with a double on each low E string. So all that slow. The interesting thing about this progression is how we get back to the F sharp from different directions. On the first time we move a whole step away from F sharp and then make our way back up using half steps. The second time we go up a whole step and make our way back down using the same half step. So we're approaching it from two different directions but with the same exact intervals. It's a reflective riff in the sense that it acts like a mirror. Not the mirror, but a mirror, an innocent mirror. We come down from the F sharp to an E F, then up to G sharp G. So it's a very interesting sound. It kind of sounds clunky, honestly. It doesn't really sound like a normal progression, and that's because it's not. So two half steps below, two half steps above, as above, so below. Remember that saying. And the fifths and the tritones are also mixed around each time. So the first time we have a perfect fifth here, and then a tritone second. The second time around we have the tritone first and then a perfect fifth second to resolve back into the F sharp. So that's kind of interesting how that happens. The tritones are pretty tricky to classify in a theoretical sense, but I do believe that they both represent leading tones. So that's why I'm going to refer to them as a seven leading tone and a two leading tone, all right, to represent the uh, major leading tone and a minor leading tone, respectively. Basically diminished, that's what they're trying to get across. So we have the one chord is F sharp, the flat six chord over F sharp, so that's the flat six chord in first inversion, a D chord over an F sharp, which is the root note of our key, going into a flat seven chord, which is the E, and then up to here, we have B and F, but that's really F and B. So that's that half step motion coming back in, so that's just our leading tone, leading tone seven. Come back into the one, flat six again, 
And then here, the two chord to a flat two Neapolitan coming back in. So pretty neat actually when you get down to it. This is all pretty cool, but nothing is as cool as the way that John Myung handles this line. Check it out. That's right, I never knew those harmonics were in there either, but you can see that he's outlining all those chords, he's keeping that F sharp on the bottom, he hits that harmonic, that's still an F sharp chord, and then he's moving chromatically to the different notes switching around, so nothing really crazy beyond the harmonic, I just thought it sounded really cool. This riff also serves to support this synth line, so take a listen to that. And continues to support the same line even when the guitar joins in for the second pass, which sounds like this. This line uses different arpeggios to match up with the chords underneath and different shapes like this. So all those different shapes start off with a B minor 9 shape, right? Because we have this. That represents a B shape. But wait a minute, I thought we were in F sharp. Even though this whole section is in F sharp technically, we're still setting up to go back into B minor, which explains why we're using so many notes in that key. We're over at the 9th fret of the D string coming up to the 11th, back down, then into the 9th fret of the A string, coming up 12, 11, 9, D, back down to that one. So we're hinging on B, solidifying the idea that this is a B minor 9 arpeggio. The next shape represents an E in first inversion. Just like that. So you just play the first inversion triad going up A string, D string, G string, D string. Just like that. The next shape goes like this. So we're starting off on the 8th fret of the A string, okay, which is an F. Then we go to the 9th fret of the D string, which is a B. Then the 10th fret of the G, which is another F. Full-blown tritone, but that represents the shapes we saw earlier in the rhythm. You want to make sure you're hitting that pattern exactly, coming back down to the A string so you can start back up at the beginning when it's time to repeat it. So real slow, B minor, E, F tritone. And then you just repeat again. This time, we do that. That's at the 11th fret of the A going to the 12th of the D. Those are the exact same notes that happened under here. Right? Except you're just playing straight eighth notes going through. So one more time again, real slow. You want to do all alternate picking. B minor 9 shape. E, tritone, again. time on the fourth ending we do this all right so that's a beautiful way to transition out of that using more of a scalar shape to get us out but we're actually on E minor at that point and this is where the rhythm changes as well the rhythm guitar actually winds up going down to an E to a D and then a B so that we hit that nice big B power chord down at the bottom big beefy B and we handle the lead up top by doing this that's one, two, flat three, and five of the E minor chord. And then here, that's the fifth, sixth, major seventh, and the major third of the D chord. So we're basically outlining a D major seven. Totally cool. And then of course ending on a B, which is the root note of the next chord progression. Back in B minor, where we belong. And you want to kind of change positions in the middle too. Pointer ring, pinky ring, pointer middle, pinky, pinky, and boom middle finger right on that root note. This B directly segues into the first guitar solo, which is more of like a melodic rehash of what we heard earlier. Check it out. at the end of 
that fast riff right in on the first note, which is a B, the ninth fret of the D string. And you can either use your middle finger or your pointer finger for that one. I know I said middle before, but hey, you can use both. It doesn't matter as long as you get to the note. Then we come up here to the ninth fret of the G. There's a lot of that motion going on if you haven't realized already. We always go with those fourths and then into the fifth. So that's a common resolution in this piece as well. A perfect fourth moving to a perfect fifth rather than a fourth going to a third, which classically would be what happens more often. This time we're going up in the opposite direction. Rock and roll, man. After that seventh and ninth, we do a trill, which is a hammer and a pull from the same frets play down to that 12th fret back up so lots of vibrato on the notes that you're holding out as well and it's very important that you acknowledge these very specific articulations because they keep on moving through the next part so check this out we're coming right down a B minor scale into the ninth fret and then continuing down that same thing Lots of vibrato on those notes you're holding out. So let me play that slowly one more time. Two, three. Little trill. Trill. And nice vibrato on that last note, which, by the way, resolves to the major third of the D chord, just like Derek Sherinian did at the beginning. Go figure. We come right back to the root note after that, like this, but this time we have to slide up to an E with that nice perfect fifth power chord shape up the octave. So with this we're at the 14th fret, 16, 14, and then hopping up an octave from there to the high E, and then bending into an F sharp like this. Adding a little vibrato toward the end. It's very important where you hit the vibrato, because otherwise it's gonna sound out of tune when you're practicing with the recording. Let me get that one more time. Right after that peak, we have to release that bend into a pull-off, just like this. It's as if you're playing the 19th, 17th, and 15th fret, Mi, Re, Do, Three Blind Mice. And then come here, 17, 15, and then this. Okay, so let me play that from here. A little vibrato. Very nice melodic movement. And then we slide down from here into that lick, which is a C Lydian lick, just like the introduction as well. So we're basically starting on this 11th fret of the G, bending up a half step to the G, and then a bend and release down and then into the 10th fret, sliding out of it pretty quickly. A real quick recap, make sure you follow all the articulation. Ready? Lots of vibrato, and slide, octave jump, full step bend, vibrato, release. And then we're ready for the first verse. Just like I had explained in the previous video for the Crimson Sunrise, this next section happens a full tritone away. It's also the first lyrical section as well, but this time, we don't have the luxury of having a nice G in the C chord bring us a half step down to the F sharp. This time we're just moving a full tritone away as if it doesn't matter. Not exactly sure how this is going to help us regain our innocence, but uh, well, this is what we're dealing with here. Before I get into this wacky timing, let's just get into the shapes and the functions of what's happening with the chords. And just like the earlier sections, way back in the first video, these Roman numerals will reflect the key center of B, so keep that in mind. We're starting on an F sharp minor 11 chord that looks like this. First finger on the low E string, second fret, pinky on the fourth of the D string, skipped up and then the middle finger on the G string right here. And we're gonna play six notes consecutively like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
coming all the way from the high E to the low E in one single breath. This then goes right to a G6-9. So we got another 6-9 chord. I don't have to keep going over this. Anybody who's been watching these videos knows how much Dream Theater loves 69. So here we go. We go down here. We got the G6-9 with the middle finger at the third fret of the low E, pointer at the second fret of the G, and the ring at the third fret of the B string with the open strings in between, like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Letting them all ring out. So we have six notes, then eight notes on the second chord. And then for all of these add nine chords coming up, we're hitting four notes apiece. One, two, three, four. 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 Pretty straightforward, right? And everything is right in the key of B minor. Let me play this slowly for you. So we have the F sharp minor 11. I must mention that all of those notes add up to 30, which puts us in a time signature of, believe it or not, 15-8 for two measures. Okay, now I know that sounds crazy because everything the guitar was just playing were completely even notes. Well, listen to what Mike Portnoy is playing on the drums. That's right, he's playing a measure of 15-8 by breaking it up into a measure of 3-4 and a measure of 9-8, all while the guitar is not playing that at all. The guitar is, almost feels like it's in 4, so this is kind of crazy the way that it bounces in and out of odd times. And it's all because of Mike Portnoy's drumming that this is in an odd time signature, but it does add up to 30 at the end of the day, so 15-8 timing. And if you take a look at it, the guitar part can really be seen as a measure of 3 to a measure of 8-8, eight, eight, and then two measures of 4 to end it out, along with that 3-4-9-8 drum part going two times. Now there's a little feeling of unrest because the guitar part cuts off the final eighth note of the 9-8 measure that Mike Portnoy is playing. So take a listen to that civil unrest going on between the guitar and the drums. wacky way of getting through that timing, but hey, the youthful exuberance on display during the Images and Words demo is happening real hard right here, so we should be grateful for that. The pre-chorus section follows a similar ascending progression that the first verse does, but changes some things around. The first of which is a major change, no pun intended. We're going from F sharp minor 11 to F7 and 11. So we've seen that shape before, but we have to hold it with these fingers like this, pointer, pinky, and ring, and we arpeggiate up it, just like that. So it's going from a minor key to a major key. That's a major five chord right now, dominant seven. A distortion guitar is added to make it heavy. And a dirty organ is added on top to make it even heavier. Not to mention, everybody conforms to that 3-4-9-8 timing. There's no funny business or tomfoolery going on here like during the verse. With all that in mind, take a listen to the riff. said the guitar is playing around with similar voicings but this time we have a lot more breathing room in between check it out it's like we finally have some room to just take a break and chill for a little bit which is very uncharacteristic of dream theater and we play five note arpeggios for each of those chords one two and that continues to go again. The second half, we change it around a little bit. We have most of the same chords with some different voicings. We have the F sharp seven with the added 11th, G six nine, but this time 
we're adding a high fifth fret on the top with the pinky there. Very nice, wide sounding chord, very fifth inspired. And then to hit the A, we bring it all the way up to the seventh fret, A sus two, seven, nine, 10, seven, boom. Beautiful sound. And then we end on an E sus two, playing all the way from the low E string, barring all those strings. And of course, adding a little bit of whammy bar at the end there. And you wanna make sure you stop that when the riff on the bottom, the dirty riff, starts playing its busy portion. That's a crucial part of the compositional angle. Now that riff in question we'll get to, but let's talk about what the dirty guitar does through that entire progression. It starts off on power chords, basically. So F sharp, up to G, following the same exact timing, to A, and then B, so just ascending up the scale. F sharp, G, do, 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 A, and then we hit an E at the fifth fret of the low B string, and we play this riff. This is where that E sus two in the clean part cuts off. You want to get right in there. With a slight bend on that D power chord. Look at this. Nice and bluesy to get us into the chorus section. Now that's a uh, tritone away from the B. That's F, E, D. All right, and then right into a D, so that's a flat third coming into the root. Very, very bluesy. Let's hear both the clean and dirty guitar playing through that whole pre-chorus. Just for the hell of it, let's give Derek's dirty organ some showtime as well. Ooh-wee, that's a hot and heavy load coming off that dirty organ. That makes me want to sing uh, the chorus section, so let's take a look at that. brings back the progression from the very intro of the Crimson Sunrise. I'm starting to think that the Crimson Sunrise is a pretty vital part to this composition, if you know what I'm saying. We also add in a heavy-ass guitar and another goddamn dirty organ just for the hell of it. The other difference is a measure of 9-8 to elongate the progression a little bit. Let me show you what I'm talking about. We start over on a B, a low B. We go up an octave. Do these fourths. Fifth fret of the E, third fret, fifth fret, third fret, first fret, with that measure of nine eighths. So we're adding an extra chord with that dotted quarter note pulse going through the whole thing. So one more time. It's almost like it's adding together the two parts of the intro. So the first part of the intro only goes to E to D, and the second part goes E to C. But here we're adding the two together, so maybe there's some kind of synthesis going on. Now I like to think of this as an extremely deep version of the Iron Maiden progression, right? Imagine playing the Trooper over here. I'm sure somebody's done it play it here first, okay? If you didn't hear it anywhere else, you heard it here first. Iron Maiden the Trooper, but in a change of seasons. The second time around, we play the exact same chords, right? So a, B, E, D, A, G, but this time, we do this, and then right back to the intro. We're actually using the E as a pivot chord back to the F sharp. So the E, instead of being the four chord of the B minor, it's now the flat seventh chord of the F. So we're actually changing quality right in the middle of the progression. Very cool. Instead of coming down to the C to ruin the whole thing, we're gonna go E, D, E, F sharp. All right, now if you start that on F sharp, you can get the trooper in that key. It's the exact same chord progression, but it's just being shifted up for the usage of getting back to the key of F sharp. Very, very, very cool. Awesome stuff. So after that pivot chord, the intro section comes back with all of the same elements with one slight rhythmic variation in the middle. Let's see if you can spot it. 
That's right, on the second time around we have a little interplay with the rest of the band with this rhythmic G-sharp tritone to a G power chord. Dun, 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 dun. Let me play it in context. We have the F-sharp, D over F-sharp, E, and then F-sharp, D over F-sharp, bum, 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 all downstrokes as well to make it as tight as possible. You gotta make it tight, Junior. We go on to repeat it, and the final ending is business as usual as the other part ended, so... Just like that, with that held out G that's not really held out for very long at all. The guitar during verse 2 uses the all too familiar open B and E strings ringing out over the chord trick. That's something very characteristic of early dream theater, specifically images and words and awake, and it's no exception on a change of seasons. Now, the only difference between the chords of this verse and the last verse is that, well, we do change some around, um, but we allow a lot more space to let the drums and bass set up the rhythm in 15-8. Let's take a listen to the isolated drums. Portnoy is explicitly outlining the 15-8 timing by splitting it up into two groupings of six and one grouping of three, right? Four, five, six, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, two, 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 one, two, three, just like that. Now the drums are straightforward enough, a little odd, but pretty damn straightforward. Now the bass part is all too ridiculous. No wonder John Myung never said a single word to Kevin. If I had these thoughts in my head, then I wouldn't either. Check this out. Sound familiar? Well, not quite yet. John Myung is foreshadowing a riff that the rest of the band is going to be playing later on, full blast, namely right after verse 2. But John Myung is playing it for the entirety of verse 2. This causes every single chord to be on top of a pedal F sharp all the way through the progression, adding just that little extra tension that I don't think we really need. We have enough tension after Kevin Moore left the band. Now John Myung is trying to create waves. The guitar part is just a four chord progression based on some of the earlier voicings, but we have a different thing going on here. We start off on this F sharp minor 11, like this, and we play it, one, two, three, four, and then let that ring throughout the entire rest of the measure. Then we hit an E add 9 with the same rhythm, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three. And then an A add 9 over here at the 7th fret. So we're actually using an E major shape from down here, but we're going to use these fingers at the 7th fret like this. That creates an A add 9, same timing, and then a B add 11 with those open B and E's ringing out above. Very nice. And remember that all of these chords are now on top of an F sharp thanks to John Myung. Let's listen to the second half. exact progression goes through, but different voicings and rhythms are played. Start up on this F sharp sus 2 at the 9th fret of the A string. We play this rhythm. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 10. Let it ring with a little whammy. We come down to the E to do basically the same thing, but we cut off one note at the end. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 2, 3. And then we come to this. Same thing as the first one. Now, And then for the last one, we just have a string of eighth notes that don't stop. It's like a fury, but it's a very delicate fury because it sounds glassy and beautiful. Check it out. And that ends the entire measure of 15-8 as you're playing every single one of those. So you're actually going to have 15 notes there. After verse 2 plays, we finally get to the riff that John Myung has been foreshadowing for the past few measures over here. So check that out. The timing is
is still in 15-8, but we have to focus on very, very specific rhythmic spots to get this right. We're basically targeting three different chords throughout this. An F sharp power chord, a muted F sharp, a B up here played as a perfect fourth at the fourth fret of the D and the G, and then an A at the second fret as a perfect fourth. Now, when we put that all together, we have this. Chord, mute, chord, mute, mute, chord, chord, mute, chord, mute, mute, chord. Just like that, you have to do that two times, and then you end it like this. One, two, three. All right, so let's try that again. Chord, mute, mute, chord, mute, 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 chord, chord, mute, mute, chord, mute, 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 chord, da, 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 da. Adding to a total of 15 notes for a 15-8 measure. Now to count that out, we have to do this. One, two, and three, four, and five, six. One, two, and three, four, and five, six. One, two, three, one, two, and three, four, and five, six. Two, and three, four, and five, six. Da, da, da. Did you notice at the ending there, I played something slightly different? It's actually a little bit easier, but it's kind of stupid how, you know, similar it actually is. Instead of going E, F sharp, G to the flat two, we're going E to F sharp. But that time, we're only playing single F sharp mutes instead of a power chord. The only two fingers we're using are the pointer and the pinky to get us through the entire thing. Look, power chord with the pointer and pinky. Pinky on that perfect fourth voicing. And then the pointer can handle the A down here. We're just going F sharp, B, A, F sharp, B, A, E, F sharp, G, A. Just like with anything that's tricky like this, you need to internalize this rhythm until it feels just as natural as a four to the floor groove. After we finish up those two unique endings with these power chords, we come into a very similar idea, basically the same riff, but now just using individual notes instead of power chords. Check it out, ready? One, two, and three, four, five, six. One, two, and three, four, five, six. One, two, three, uh. Now let's take a look at that real quick. I'm just gonna stop it there. We start over on the second fret with the pointer, and you can use your ring to hit the octave above that to get that one, two end. On the next beat, we're going to hit with the pinky on the B, right? And then come back down. Right after that, on the sixth beat, you're going to hit the A and then come back down. Same finger as well, so you're just riding up and down those strings with the pointer finger. Coming back for the second time, we do this. So you have to do a little double dub on that two, on that second fret, coming from the A down to an E. Now that looks all part of the same shape, but really this E is replacing the E power chord we saw before, okay? So this is beat one of that three eight measure that hits in with those power chords. So we're gonna go E, F sharp, G, F sharp, or E, just like that. So let me play this whole thing slow. One, two, and three, four, five, six, one, two, and three, four, five, six, one, two, three, uh. You really need to feel that second fret D string as the first beat. Otherwise, you're going to get lost. It's going to sound like it's coming in or elongating the measure a little bit. It's not. It's keeping it exactly the same in the 15-8 timing, split up in that same way, but that's the downbeat instead of something else. So keep that in mind and don't stress the small stuff or something like that. I got to try and make everybody feel better after these because it's a lot of stuff. The second time through, we act as if we're going to play the same part again, but we don't. And basically, we're going to throw everything I said before out the window for that last part. That was very short-lived. This time, we're actually creating a measure of 7-8 using that same second fret. So this time, we are elongating the measure. And then coming into a 4-4 four, four, note rhythm, which is really pretty awesome. So check this out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's pretty cool, man. So let's take a look at that again. So we have one, two, and three, four, five, six, seven. That's the measure of seven. Now this time it's, a, it's crucial that you actually feel that second fret as the seventh beat. All right, so we're gonna skip that right there. Seventh beat, boom, right into the one. We're coming to this four, four, 16th note pattern. Now I'm gonna split this up into four parts, but check this out. Awesome, very basic actually. It's just 
three consecutive beats of 16th notes and then two eighth notes to end down the scale. We're starting at the fourth fret of the G with our ring finger. And then we're gonna take our pinky to the fifth of the B and then come down with the pointer on the second fret. So that's basically what we're gonna be doing. Those three fingers the entire time, all right? Nothing different. But we're going down like this. That's the first pattern. If you can practice that first and get that down, you can add the second one. Just like that. Okay? Boom. Then we add another one. So now practice all three of those together. Boom. That's pretty awesome, right? And then we just add two eighth notes at the end. Nice and staccato going May, Re, Do, back to F sharp. Now this is actually an F sharp minor pentatonic riff and we're treating it as if we're in the key of F sharp minor as well, but we all know we're gonna come back to B at some point. This does serve to get us back into the pre-chorus though, which is really an F sharp minor, so we immediately have a Picardy third, causing a major five chord on the downbeat. Woo wee, this is getting crazy. After that bit, the pre-chorus comes around to play exactly the same as it did the first time around, but I neglected to mention something, so I'll mention it this time. Check this out. Just a cool little fill to keep us interested as we mull through the same old boring chords again. Good job, Mike. The second and final chorus also plays through the exact same way, except for the very ending. So I'm gonna start at the beginning here. We have that low B, that right? So here we go. B. replacing that ending instead of doing E D E we're going E D A all power chords fifth third and fifth fret and then hopping down to an open E now you're probably asking Mike why are we hitting an open E we've been hitting an E at the fifth fret over here the entire time well the reason being is because we now need some extra notes to hit that chord voicing to make it a little more wide and open Basically just playing a giant E5 power chord by stacking up E, B, E, B, and then B, E. Those are all just two notes being stacked on top of each other, but for a very nice open and wide open sound. Am I repeating myself too much? I think so. And of course the final chord is just a regular E power chord, and that's basically the new key center for what we will call Carpe Diem. A oh, baby. Not that song, not the Metallica song. Uh, the Dream Theater song, of course. Part three of A Change of Seasons, which, by the way, is going to be coming up, not now, obviously, but it's going to be coming up next. I'm moving through these pretty damn quickly, I think. If you'd like to further support the channel, please go to www.subscribestar.com slash Romanova Music. You can pledge as much as you would like per month. For a $20 option, you get access to my Romanova Guitar Gym, which is basically a mini-series with a bunch of exercises and uh, some cool stuff that'll make you better as a guitar player. Um, I'm just starting to roll that out now, so expect the first one to be coming out pretty soon. And I'm going to be doing it probably like every week or so. So there's going to be a lot of exercises by the time we get the ball rolling here. You can also support by uh, going to my PayPal tip jar and leaving me a tip, just a one-time donation. You can also go to my website and check out my original material, my original music. You can buy a CD, buy whatever you want. You can buy the music, just the MP3s, blah, blah, blah. Or you can click the big red button and you can get lessons from yours truly. Private lessons, that's right. Just me to you on a zoo, a boo, a do, a dippy do. So keep that in mind if you're looking to sharpen up your skills here. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot. It's been a good one. It's been a pleasure. I'll see you on episode number three. Goodbye.